Hello, everybody. Welcome. Oh. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> I forgot Patrick's bio. Maybe because I already started tapping into my wine. I'm so excited to hear Patrick talk about wine. So um, if you haven't met Patrick Alexander, we're going to um, learn a little bit more about him tonight and about some wine. So Patrick Alexander raised his family in the Bordeaux wine country of Southwest France, the Piedmont wine country of Northwest Italy, and the wine country of Northern California before moving to Florida. While working for Marcy Ullum as director of the Office of Professional Advancement at the University of Miami, he developed a popular wine appreciation program, which was offered exclusively in the uh, faculty lounge. For the past 10 years, he's been offering a three-week wine appreciation program at Books and Books and next door at Coral Gables Museum. Patrick's many published works include The Book Lover's Guide to Wine, which was featured at the 2017 Miami Book Fair. So thank you all for joining us. If you have any questions, drop them in the Q&A at the bottom and I'll make sure we answer those. But without further ado, please welcome Patrick Alexander. Good evening, everybody. As I think you know now, my name is Patrick Alexander. I hadn't realized um, Barbara was going to take all the things I plan to say, so maybe I should just go home now. Oh, I am home. Um, many years ago, I worked for Marcy Ollum at the University of Miami and developed a 12-hour wine appreciation program. Um, to be honest, it was the only way I could work out of getting paid for drinking on the job, but it worked. And for the past 10 years, I've offered the same program at Books and Books in Coral Gables and next door at the Coral Gables Museum. Uh, and in fact, as Barbara just told you, all that heavy research into wine um, ended up in the book, Book Lover's Guide to Wine. By the way, you've all had a heavy day of Zooming, so I think you all deserve to pour yourselves a glass of wine. Uh, I certainly have. <laughs> Whether, whether you deserve it or not, I'm sure you need it. <clears throat> As Barbara also told you, after leaving England in my, and, and by the way, cheers. <laughs> Barbara, thank you for the introduction. <clears throat> after leaving England in my early 20s, I moved to France, to the wine country around Bordeaux, where I married and raised my children. And then we moved to the wine country of Northern Italy um, on, 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 the, on the shores of Lake Lugano, surrounded by um, fabulous vineyards of Northern Italy. And when we came to the United States, we moved to Santa Cruz in California, again, surrounded by splendid vineyards. So after leaving England, um, as a wine lover, I've always made a point of surrounding myself with vineyards. For the past 34 years, I've been living in Coral Gables, South Florida. And I have to tell you that as a wine lover, South Florida is the best place in the world to live. Why, you ask? Well, the reason is quite simple. It's because we don't grow any wine. Now, I know Schnepplitz down in Homestead makes wine. Um, but that's fruit wine. I'm just talking about wine made from grapes. Living here in South Florida, we have access obviously to all the grape wines of California and to the wines of Oregon, the wines of Washington State, and even on the East Coast, we have the wines of Virginia and um, Finger Lakes up in New York. Also, because there's a large European population here in South Florida, there's a big demand and a big market for the wines of Europe. So we have unlimited access to the wines of France and Spain and Italy and Croatia and Hungary and Israel. Furthermore, we have a large South American population here, which gives us immediate access to the wines of Chile and Argentina. South Florida is the place for drinking wine. 
and I'm sure there's a few Australians here. Let me, um, I've not done this before, let me put up a slide and see if this works. Forgive me. Do we see this? Uh, raise your glass if you, if, if you, if you can. We can see your um, I'm sorry? We can see your slides, it looks good. Great, great. This is, uh, <clears throat> the thing about living in South Florida, you don't need to go to a wine, a specialty wine store to get good wine. Go to any Publix, any Winn-Dixie, any local grocery store, and you get what I call here the Great Wall of Wine. It's actually pretty daunting. Um, my local Publix in, in Coral Gables, for example, has about 500 different types of wine up on this great big wall. And they come from 20 to 30 different wine regions around the world, from, from New Zealand all the way up to uh, Washington State. And I've listed just a few of them um, on, on this particular slide. So that is the, um, that's a splendor. That's the reason that I'm so enthusiastic about South Florida. Now, when I lived in France, we lived near Bordeaux. We were surrounded by fabulous wines, the saint, the saint Emilion, the Pomerols, Chateau Lafitte, uh, Perchemont, Chateau d'Iquem. It was fabulous if all you wanted was Bordeaux wines. But if you wanted, for example, to taste a Burgundy, oh, well, what does he know? He's English. Uh, the English, they know nothing. And don't even mention Italian wines or Spanish wines, and certainly don't mention American wines. Uh, impossible to get. Now, admittedly, that was back in the 70s, many years ago. Things have changed. This, for example, is a catalog from uh, Leclerc, which is the equivalent of, say, Total Wines or uh, Costco. And it's a wine catalog, and it's fabulous. It's 114 pages filled with tremendous wines, wonderful selection. I think it's about 114 pages and six, six bottles per page. It's fabulous. But they're all French. There's no Italian wine here. There's no Spanish wine here. Certainly no American wine. It was the same story when we moved uh, from France to Northern Italy. There we had, uh, we were in the uh, Piedmont area and the local grape, the Nebbiolo, one of my favorites, and some of the greatest wines of, of Italy um, from Barbaresco, Barolos. We used to drink those regularly, fabulous. And we could probably get a Chianti from further south, but none of the really south, southern Italian wines were available. It was just the local wines of Piedmont. No French, no Spanish. So eventually we came to America and we moved to Santa Cruz in California. And again, fabulous choice of Californian wines. We had the best of Napa and Sonoma Valley and <clears throat> Paso Robles. But you know, it wasn't until we moved to Coral Gables, to South Florida, that I discovered that there are great wines from Oregon or Washington State, because I certainly didn't see any of them in Santa Cruz. It's here in Florida where I have the, the big choice. Now, earlier on, I was, I'm afraid I was a little bit snooty about Schnebley's, the uh, wine producer uh, in South Florida. The reason being that and, 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 and lots of the wines down there are, are delicious, but they're made with, with mangoes, with nectarines, with peaches. I'm focusing on the wines made from the, the vine, Vitus vinifera, you'll see at the top. And I've divided up, as you can see on this slide, between international varietals and regional varietals. And by that, I mean that 
if you're growing wine in Australia or New Zealand or California or Chile or Europe, you're going to have Cabernet Sauvignon, you're going to be having uh, Merlot, you're going to be having Ch uh, Chardonnays and Rieslings and Gewürztraminas. Um, those are available, they're grown, made uh, all over the world. And there is a, there is a, a, a difference between a, a Gewürztramina from um, Alsace in France to one in California. But the grape is the same and they are grown everywhere. There are other grapes, and by the way, uh, by varietel, uh, varietel is a posh French word for grape variety, type of grape. There, as I say, in the regional varietels, these are grapes which tend to be grown just in one particular place and that's what they're famous for. I'm sure it's possible to grow an Albarino, for example, um, anywhere. I mean, you can just plant it and it will grow. But the great Albarinos grow in northwest Spain, just above the, the in Galicia, just above the Portuguese border. And it would be silly to try and compete with those. They simply, something to do with the, the climate, the weather, the soil makes them unique. In the same way, uh, let's say a Malbec. A Malbec was originally, it was a, it was a grape that grew in Bordeaux, it was taken to South America and some, actually it was an Englishman, an Englishman called Newton, who had the crazy idea of planting it above 10,000 feet up in the Andes. And for some reason, the Malbec grape really thrives at that altitude. And the Malbecs from Argentina, I'm sure you've all tried them at some time or other, are just splendid. And they can't be re reproduced anywhere else. And it would be foolish to try and do so. Now the wine I'm drinking at the moment comes from, um, comes from Italy, is an Italian wine from Tus Tuscany, which is in central Italy, and it's made with a Sangiovese grape. And in fact, the only grape that they use or they, they grow in Tuscany is the Sangiovese, and it's a very ancient grape. It's, um, it was created by the, or first discovered or first named by the Romans. And Sangiovese actually is a Latin for blood of Jove, Jove being Jupiter, the, the boss god. Um, so that's what I'm drinking this evening. It's a, but the actual wine I'm drinking is called a Brunello del Montalcino because that's the village that it comes from. But the grape is a Sangiovese. Um, and while, while I'm at it, so. you want to hear? You want to hear? Is here. Patrick talking about. Marcy, can you not you mute your microphone, please? Wait, oh, I'm say Marcy, oh, I'm we're sorry. Having, we're having a we're having a serious meeting here, please. Excuse me, that's my. I old thought book. I was muted, and I had just asked my husband to go get me wine, and he had a comment. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so on that list, for example, above Sangiovese, Sangiovese is the is the is the what as I said the wine that I'm drinking. Uh, you have, for example, Nebbiolo. That is a grape from the area of Italy where my wife and I, when we lived in Italy, that was a grape. So all the wines we drank at that particular time were made with a Nebbiolo grape. There were differences between this village and that village, Barbaresco, Barolo, but the grape was always the same. Um, below Sangiovese, you'll see Tempranillo, and that's the great red grape of Spain. Most of the great red wines of Spain are made with Tempranillo. So I hope you've seen on the, going back to the international varietals, uh, these are grapes which are grown all over the world and every, everywhere, whether you're in Australia, whether you're in Chile, you can get a local Cabernet Sauvignon or a local Chardonnay. But if you want to taste real good Albarinos, you go to Spain. If you want a good if you want a good um, Sangiovese, you go to Italy, you go to Tuscany. And excuse me going over here and being rude like this, but my, I have a, a monitor which keeps turning off after every 15 minutes. So if I, if I approach the camera with my finger raised, please do, do not be offended. Um, <clears throat> so the big question is, why so many different varietals? How do you make, how do you decide which one to plant or, or, I mean, obviously you know which one to drink because you've tasted them and I like this and I don't like that. But if you're a wine grower, how do you decide 
which one to plant. What makes a great wine, in other words? Um, so let's quickly go over how wine is grown. All, the first thing is it's the latitude. Wine is grown in a belt between, say, 30 and 50 degrees, either north or south of the equator. So north of the equator, that includes the, Med the whole of the Mediterranean, going all the way up to Germany, uh, then across the Atlantic, and you've got Washington State, Oregon, California. Uh, for various reasons, we have a problem on the East Coast. South of the equator, um, there's the equivalent band between 30 and 50 degrees, and that's going from Chile, Argentina, South Africa, Australia, and New Zealand. Those are the only places in the world where we get wine. China is coming into the equation now. That's obviously on that, um, uh, but, but, but China is new. So in any way, for all sorts of reasons, we're not discussing China just at the moment. Um, elevation is important. If your vineyard is close to the equator, let's say Southern California or, or um, Southern France, then the sun, the rays of the sun are coming down directly upon it. But as you move away from the equator, the rays of the sun are going more and more diagonally. Consequently, if you're in New Zealand, away from the equator, or Germany, um, then the rays of the sun are like this. So you plant your vineyards on the south, on, on the sun-facing um, slopes of rivers. This photograph you see here is uh, the Moselle River in Germany. Uh, you can see the angle is pretty steep. It's about 60 degrees. But as a result of that, they're getting the maximum amount of sun, which uh, the, the rays which, which, which come to Germany. It does make harvesting um, <clears throat> pretty difficult. And people do, particularly if they've been sampling the wine, they do fall quite often during the harvest. Another important thing is the drainage, the soil. Those of you who have visited a, um, <clears throat> a, a vineyard probably notice it's, it's not lush. There's usually pretty thin soil. And the reason for that is that you want the roots to do their work. Down at the bottom of this, if you look at this photograph, down in the valley where the, all the alluvial soil has come, you've got nice black, thick, rich soil, and that's great for growing strawberries or tulips, but lousy for grapes lousy for wine. You will, if you plant vineyards there, you will get big, fat, juicy grapes, but they'll have no taste because the roots just sit there and there's no need to do any work. They've got all that thick black nutrient. Whereas the vines which are growing here on the hillside, they're having to set those roots down through the rocks. They're searching for water. They have to go a long way. And when they finally get the water, they pull it up like sap through all the rocks, through the, through the chalk, through the gravel, and they bring it up to the vine and they're bringing with it all the mineral tastes that make that particular wine so unique. So that's why vines need to have good drainage, but to go a long way to get it. Um, and then the varietal, the particular grape. Some grapes need a lot of rain. Some grapes need a lot of um, sun. Some grapes need a long growing season. They need to start early after the, the last frost of the winter and they need to keep going till the first frost of the fall. Uh, each of those on, on the previous slide where you had a list of different grapes, each one of them has its own demands. The ones which I listed as international grapes, they're probably the most forgiving. That's why they're able to be grown all over the world uh, under all sorts of different conditions. Whereas the ones on the other side of the slide, which were uh, regional specific, they, they're a bit more picky. They really need a bit of this and a bit of that. So now we're coming down to the big question, uh, and you've probably all come across the concept of varietal versus terroir. Really, these are just rather pompous French words, meaning grape variety. What, what's the most important thing in the wine? Is it the grape variety or is it the place where it comes from? For example, I've told you that this wine I'm drinking is a Sangiovese, 
But I've also told you that it's Brunello de, Comp uh, de, de Montalcino, so, which is the place it comes from. Let's explore this a little bit more. And a good example is a big Rotarian dinner party given in London where no wives were invited. They had to stay behind in the hotel room. Uh, you know, the British are a bit, a bit odd about things like that. Um, and after the end of the dinner, the fr a, French, a, a, a member who came from France, a Rotarian from France, went back to his hotel room and his wife said, oh, Chérie, what did you do this evening? And he told her, he told her that they started with a, a delicious Sancerre. And then with the main course, we had a Romani Conti. Mwah! And Chérie, what did you have for your dessert? Oh, you wouldn't believe a Chateau de Guem. Oh, I'm so happy. Whereas the uh, American went back to his wife just down the corridor a few doors away and he told her, well, honey, it was, uh, we had a delicious Sauvignon Blanc uh, just with a, with, a, with a starter. And then uh, with the main course, we had a wonderful Pinot Noir. And uh, at the end, we had this fabulous Semillon. Oh, with a dessert. Oh. Now, the two men have had exactly the same wines. But to the Frenchman, in fact, to any European, what was important was where it had come from. And that's how he communicated with his wife or would have communicated with anybody else what wine he had drunk, because that's how they think, where it had come from. Whereas the American, and he could have been a New Zealander or, or, or an Australian or a Chilean, um, he was more interested in what grape had the wine been made from. So that's why we have this varietal or terroir. And it really comes down to, to history. In Europe, we have a documented history of growing and making wine uh, that goes back for 3,000 years. And I'm, when I mean documented, I mean really well documented. So we've got experience of what grows well where. Well, we know that this particular grape does well in this area, under these conditions, and this particular grape does well under those conditions. So the farmers have known that, and we as wine, European wine drinkers, we don't necessarily even think about what grape it is. We just know that it's a Bordeaux, or that it's a, uh, a, a wine from Tuscany. And that's how, that's how uh, we think. And that's based on the 3,000 years of history. A good example of that, for example, well, the wine I'm drinking, let's get the, uh, this is the bottle. It's a Brunello de, Compa, uh, de, de Montalcino, as I told you, which is a, which is a village in, in, in Tuscany. But nowhere does it say that it's a Sangiovese, a Sangiovese grape. They don't need to. If it comes from, uh, if it's a Brunello, it must be. Uh, Sangiovese. Uh, the most extreme example, of course, is uh, Burgundy. The, red, the only red wines in Burgundy are made with a Pinot Noir grape. White wines are made with Chardonnay, but red wines are made with uh, Pinot Noir. The reason being that back in the early 13th century, the Duke of Burgundy, realizing that the Pinot Noir grape was really delicious, uh, really got him uh, in good relations with the King of France when he sent it down, uh, decided that's the end. And also it was great for the economy of Burgundy. So he issued an edict that anyone who grew any other red grape other than Pinot Noir would be hanged. By that, it wasn't a figure of speech. It meant that his chaps would take you out into your um, vineyard and hang you by the neck so that all your neighbors could see and learn. So uh, what do you think, Chérie? What should we, what should we uh, plant next year? Oh, I, think, uh, I think Pinot Noir would be a good idea. Um, and that, since the 13th century, that is still the case. The only red wines coming from Burgundy, uh, and by law, on, you can't put Burgundy on the bottle unless it's a Pinot Noir. Um, I hope they don't introduce that, uh, that sort of law to, uh, 
to California. A good example here, let's, let's, let's focus, because I'm drinking an Italian wine, let's focus on Italy. So uh, at, at, at the top right of this slide, you can see Piedmont, which is where my wife and I lived uh, when we moved to Italy. And as I said, we, 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 we drank uh, wines from Barbaresco and Barolo. Barbaresco and Barolo are two towns, uh, little, you know, those cute little uh, towns up, up, up on hills all fortified and walled, um, surrounded by vineyards. And those are fabulous wines. But, and the two are different. You can actually tell the difference, or we certainly could when we lived there, the difference between a Barolo and a Bar Barbaresco. But the grape is the same. The dominant grape in Piedmont, it's not the only grape, but the dominant grape is a Nebbiolo grape. It's a very big, powerful, broad shouldered type of grape. The wine I'm drinking at the moment, the Brunello de Montalcino, um, as I said, is a Sangiovese. All the red grapes in Tuscany are Sangiovese. Here's a map of Tuscany. So um, you can see you can see the village where this wine was grown, both grown and made, is Montalcino. And this is called a Brunello del Montalcino, but it's a Sangiovese grape. It's the same grape as the neighboring village of Montepulciano, uh, where the wine is called, and it's been, uh, it's, it's Vino Nobile del Montepulciano. It's, it's called that because during the Middle Ages, that was the most popular wine with the nobility. So Vino Nobile, uh, Vino Nobile del Montepulciano. <clears throat> and in the north of Tuscany, we have Chianti. Now, even though I lived in Italy, I, I, and I, I love Chianti, but I probably, I can't tell the difference between a Chianti from Florence or a Chianti from Pisa or a Chianti from Siena. Um, but the locals can. And it's all to do with the fact that the soil in this part of Tuscany is different from the soil here and in, in Siena, for example, it rains more. And in Pisa, you're closer to the to the ocean. All these little variations change the final taste of the local wine. But Chianti, Brunello de Montalcino, Vino Nobile de Montepulciano, they're all the same grape, Sangiovese, the blood of God. Well, the blood of Jove. So, so far, I've only talked about red wine. I'm going on and on, half an hour now, about red wine. There are actually six types of wine. The important thing to know is that when you crush grapes, whether they're red or whether they're white, the juice is the same. I mean, it's the same color. So without the skins, um, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. So red wine, not only does it come from the uh, red skin grapes, or black skin grapes, um, whatever you want, purple skin grapes, the, the skin is left on while it ferments. Fermenting is what you do, is, is, is you, you crush the grapes, you put them in big uh, fermenting vats, and basically what happens is the, the yeast in the skin eats the sugar in the juice and converts it into two things. Um, carbon dioxide, which makes all the bubbles, and alcohol. So the more sugar there is, uh, the higher the alcohol content. Sorry, my monitor has just cancelled out again. There we go. Uh, so that's how red wine is made. Now, white wine, um, they take the skins off. But even, you know, with, with a white grape, even if they left the skins on, uh, it still wouldn't change the colour. But within white wines, depending on the varietal, there are shades of, of, of difference. For example, um, an Albarino, a Sauvignon Blanc, they're very, very, very pale, uh, almost yellowish, uh, straw colored, very faint, as opposed to say a Chardonnay, which is another white wine, but a Chardonnay is, um, which is a very popular wine here in, in, in uh, America. There's a deeper, more golden color. 
So there are shades of, but that comes from the juice, not from the skin. Now, rosé wine, I know that there's, uh, it, it used to be very sort of looked down upon uh, rosé wines. They are coming back into, that were coming for the first time into fashion in America, thank goodness. Um, there was an idea that they were made by pouring red bottle of red wine, bottle of white wine, and mix, mixing them up. Not true. You make red, you make uh, rosé wines by leaving the skins on for a short period of time during fermentation. And obviously, the longer you leave them on, the the the, the darker it becomes. The best rosé wines um, come from Provence and the southern coast of uh, the Mediterranean coast of, of, of France. I've always I've always loved them, but when I first came to America, they were very much looked down upon. Um, they were sort of they were called blush wines. They were sweet. They were nasty, and um, and Americans didn't like them. Rightly so. The the what you were exposed to. In the past 10 years, I would say, they've suddenly really come. Uh, you are discovering them, and it's the ones from southern France. And the wonderful thing is, even though they're coming from southern France, they're not particularly expensive, and they are perfect for the South Florida climate. I think that's why um, they're so popular in, in, in South Beach. Now we come to sparkling wine. In the old days, all sparkling wines used to be called champagne and they have a very distinctive um, shape to the bottle. And then about 15, 20 years ago, maybe more than that, the champagne growers, champagne is an area within France, they decided that you can't call and they, the, the European courts and the world court and everybody else agreed, you can't call your wine a champagne unless it's grown and made in a champagne area. Now, the way champagne is made is um, they interrupt the fermentation. Fermentation, like any other wine, is going on in a big barrel, but before it's finished, they bottle the wine. So the fermentation is carrying on within the bottle. And that's why champagne bottles are much heavier and the glass is much thicker than any other bottle. Your car tire, for example, has 30 pounds per square inch. This little bottle has pressure of 90 pounds per square inch. And that's why it's, um, that's why it has to be so strong. So the way they make, so, so we've got the, the fermentation is going on, this continuing in the bottle. And what they do is they rack the bottles like this, the neck down, uh, and the whole process is called a remouage. And you have all these bottles at this angle, and it's a man's job. He's, 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 he's called a riddler. In fact, when I retire, I hope to get a job as a riddler. And every day he goes down and he turns the bottles gently like this. I think it's a great profession. Looking forward to it. And when the fermentation has fit, what's happening while he's doing this, the fermentation is going on, the yeast is turning the sugar into alcohol and carbon dioxide, and the dead yeast is falling down here into the neck. So when the fermentation is finished, they freeze the neck, open it up, pull it out, top it up with a bit more champagne, and put in these very special corks with a wire cage all around it. And that's how champagne is made. So if, and, and of course, champ the Champagne area used to be owned by the Duke of Burgundy. Consequently, the only grapes that they use are Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. So if you're in Australia or California and you want to make a, a sparkling wine, if you use the method that I just described, if you use Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, you use a remouage, you hire a hire a retired UM uh, professor to be a, a riddler, um, then you, are, you can't call it champagne, but you are allowed to put on the bottle, on your label, méthode champenoise, the champagne method, or méthode traditionnelle. And that doesn't just apply to Australians or um, Californians. This bottle, for example, is not a champagne, it was made elsewhere in France, 
but it is a French sparkling wine. And as you can see, it says on it, Méthode Traditionnelle. They can't call it Champagne because it's not from Champagne, but it is Méthode Traditionnelle, which means it's from France and they've used all the process that I just described. So that's red wine, white wine, rosé, sparkling wine. Now distilled wine, for those of you who remember from your um, chemistry classes at school, distillation is a matter of heating up. So you heat up the wine and it separates the water from the uh, alcohol because the alcohol um, evaporates faster than the water. And you collect the alcohol and that's how you make, that's where we get brandy, eau de vie. The, it was actually uh, invented by the Dutch in the 17th century. The reason being that they were growing, they were, um, um, they were taking, they were growing wine just north of Bordeaux in Charente, and they were taking it back to Holland, but they were taxed. When they took the wine out of France, they were taxed by the French. And when they took it into Holland, they were also taxed by the Dutch, or actually by the Spanish, uh, who, 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 who were in control. So being, but, but the, the, the taxation was based on volume. So many gallons, so many francs. Dutch being very, very uh, savvy people, they decided, well, if we heat it up, if we distill it, reduce it to, um, you know, to pure alcohol, and then we export it, the, the taxes will be that much less. And when we bring it in, there will be that much less. And when we've got it home, we add water to it, and Bob's your uncle, or whatever they, they say, however you say that in Dutch. Um, we, 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 we've, they're very savvy people, the Dutch. They, uh, but when they got it home and they tasted it, they discovered it's really nice. It's be a pity to add water to it. So the Dutch actually called it Brandtischwein, which means burnt wine. And that's where we get the name brandy from, Brandtischwein. And um, jolly good job too. Now fortified wine, by fortified wine, I'm talking about sherry, port, Madeira, um, all those sorts of wines, what they do there is uh, they will make the wine in a normal process and then they'll take some of it, usually the, the poorer quality, and they'll distill it. In other words, producing a certain amount of brandy or eau de vie. And then they add that back into the original wine. So a sherry, which uh, when it's first come out of fermentation, is only maybe 12% alcohol by adding in the extra eau de vie that raises it up, that fortifies it um, to 16, 18 degrees of alcohol. And that's fortified wine. So let's talk about glasses. If you are in um, a restaurant or a wine bar and you're buying your wine by the glass, then I do encourage you to in persuade your server to fill your glass up to here. <laughs> Get your money's worth. But otherwise, if you're pouring wine for yourself, then this is the level. So the, you pour it to the widest part of the glass, as you can see here. And the reason for that is that we want to expose the wine to as much air as possible. My monitor's gone out again, forgive me. <clears throat> um, you want to expose it to as much air as possible for the same reason also that if you're drinking white wine, you hold it by the stem so as not to heat the wine. But if you're drinking red wine, um, by all means cup it like this and swirl it around. Your hand is heating up the wine. Be careful if you're wearing a white jacket while you do this. <clears throat> this is the same reason that we decant wine. So this being a uh, Chateau de Feet, I want it exposed to as much air as possible. 
it's a good wine so as you can see it is now this has got the maximum exposure for a bottle people talk about oh opening the bottle uh, an hour before you serve the wine to let it breathe but let's think about it when you do that it's only this amount of wine which is exposed to the air and this is by the way a chateau lafitte it's rather splendid wine deserves full treatment um, so a good wine glass is wide here to allow the maximum exposure to the air but narrow at the top at the mouth and the reason for that is that what with the exposure to the air um, my hand warming it I'm raising the molecules they're evaporating all those um, aromas in the wine all those magical things which have come out of the minerals as the roots are pulling it up um, from, from, from the earth. And they're rising up in the glass, but the mouth is narrow. So it's concentrating them all here so that when I put my nose in, I get the maximum, um, what should we say, smell, the maximum. Uh, it's going straight to my brain. God help my brain. Um, it's going to the olfactory bulb. What is the olfactory bulb, you may ask? Think about eating a plate of ice cream, really cold ice cream, greedily with a big spoon, and you're feeling a bit guilty about it, and then suddenly you get this terrible pain right there between your eyes, just back a bit. That's your olfactory nerve, overloaded with your greedy ice cream. Um, it's the most primitive part of the brain. It's where it's a reptilian part. It's where all our memories are housed. It's the most sensitive part. It's the most, um, if you like, unconscious part. And that's where we get our deepest feelings. And that's why the smell, the odor, the aromas from the wine, when they go up there, that's what releases all the memories and all the thoughts and all the wonderful feelings that good wine can really give us. So in my classes, I, I, I have a, a little ritual where I, I get my students to, first of all, uh, swirl, which is what we're, what we're doing, even we're wearing a white jacket. Then the snort. And the first one is the most important. The, the second one, uh, you've lost that sensitivity. So it's the very first one that gives you the really the first impression of the wine. The next stage is the slurping. Again, a dangerous thing to do if you're wearing a white jacket. This is well the foolish of me. Um, basically, what you do, you take in a little amount of wine, um, just enough to put under your tongue, and then you you breathe in. I exaggerate in class usually. <laughs> Um, but you don't need to go that far. What you're doing is you're bringing in oxygen. And again, just like swirling it around in the glass, you're evaporating and releasing the aromas, which again are going up to the olfactory nerve. That is really the most sensitive part of the brain. And that's where most of our emotions and tastes um, are centered. And then the final thing we do is what I call sloshing. So, What I'm doing there is swirling it around in my mouth. The reason being that the inside of the cheeks, the roof of the mouth, um, the tongue, they all have different sensitivities. Um, uh, um, so this is what, what, what somebody cleverly uh, came up with the, the, the name mouthfeel. That's exactly what it is. We get a feeling um, for, the, for the mouth. And some wines, particularly white wines, you don't really need to do that and you don't, you don't get much from it. You might do from a big Chardonnay, for example, particularly a, a Californian Chardonnay. Um, but with the red wines, this is a wonderful thing to do. And some of the big wines, the Nebbiolos, the Zinfandels, a uh, good Cabernet Sauvignon, you get almost a velvety coating. It's just, it's, um, some people talk about you can almost eat the wine, you can chew it, it's so tactile. 
So that's what uh, we, and we've done all this, by the way, before we've even swallowed. Uh, swallowing is probably one of the least important things to do. So before we finish, very important to talk about the difference between old world or European wine and new world. And by new world, forgive me, I'm not being condescending, but just anything outside Europe, uh, whether it's the Americas or the Antipodes. So as I boringly uh, um, emphasized, we have 3000 years of documented uh, wine growing in Europe. And as a result of that, we've developed this whole traditions of terroir, knowing that this particular wine grows here and this particular wine is best there. And as a result of that, we tend to describe wines or think of wines or um, talk about wines in terms of where they came from. The other thing about, the, uh, about Europe is the climate is much milder than it tends to be in, Australia, in the wine growing areas of Australia or California. Um, so there's less sun and as a result of that, there's less sugar produced in the grapes. And as a result of that, there's less alcohol produced in the wine after fermentation. So typically a, um, so typically a, a, a European wine will be 12 and percent alcohol as opposed to a new world wine, which tend to be more like 14, 14 and percent. I meant to point out that this, when I was tasting this wine, I thought it, the Brunel is very special. I don't know whether you can see, but this is 13 and a half percent alcohol. Very unusual for a European wine. In the new world, as I've gone over several times, because we don't have the tradition, Therefore, when you arrive for the first time and you want to grow wine in Australia or Chile, you've got all your, your vines with you, you plant them all. You don't know which one is going to um, develop best in what, what area. We're gradually realizing Napa Valley, for example, is building a reputation for Cabernet Sauvignon. You'd be very silly to go and buy land in Napa Valley and grow anything else. Um, on, 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 there are exceptions, but so in a hundred years time, for example, I think um, California, we will have, oh, this particular area. We're already getting that. Passerobles, for example, down uh, just north of Santa Barbara. They are really specializing in, in um, Rome type wines, Grenache, Mouverde, and, uh, and Syrah. So these things are evolving, but you are still a new country, you know, very young but you are coming on. The other thing about Europe is the rainfall is um, unpredictable. And the rainfall is important. Obviously, rain, rain, water is important for fines. So that's why vintage is important, more important in Europe than it is in the New World. Because from one year to the next, this year there wasn't enough rain, um, next year there's too much rain, and that, that particular year, there's um, the perfect amount of rain. So it's important to put that on the label. And by the way, when you see a vintage, the year on the label, that means the year that the grapes were picked. It doesn't mean when the wine was bottled or when it was fermented or anything else. It's when the grapes were picked. And that's how you can compare. Um, and you know, 1970, whatever, was a great year because the sun shone and there was a sufficient amount of rain, whereas the next year uh, was bad. Now in the new world, in California and Australia uh, and South America, many of the vineyards are in much more desert-like conditions and they don't depend on the rainfall. They have irrigation. That means that instead of mother nature controlling things, means the farmer is controlling things. That means year after year after year, he gives a precise amount of water and therefore the wines are going to be pretty similar from year to year. And you need that. You need that if, you are, um, if you've got a contract with, with Costco or Total Wine or 
Tesco or whatever, uh, because they expect thousands of cases of identical wine um, year after year after year in order to uh, put them on the, on the shelves. As I said, also, they New World wines, whether it's in California, I mean, obviously this doesn't apply to Oregon or to Washington State, but certainly California, certainly Southern California, certainly Australia, um, there's much more sun. And with much more sun, that means the grapes are going to produce more sugar. And if they've got more sugar in them, then that means in fermentation, there's going to be more alcohol. And that's why on the whole, there are always exceptions, but on the whole, New World wines are about 14 and a half sometimes. I mean, certainly down in Australia, we're getting 15 and a half percent alcohol from the wines. We have a few minutes left, but we do have quite a few questions too. Okay, let me just finish off with a little bit of chauvinism. Okay. The British influence on the world's wine trade. Um, just as I started the evening by saying South Florida is the best place to live in the world because we don't grow any wine. In the same way, Britain is probably the most important influence on the world of wine because they don't grow any wine and therefore they have to go off and pinch other people's wines. Um, the reason that Elizabeth I sent colonists over to America, to uh, Virginia, was simply to grow wine so they didn't have to deal anymore with the beastly French or the Spanish. And the Hundred Years' War, which actually went on for about 300 years, was all to do with the wine of Bordeaux. Uh, because the British um, can't grow wine at home, they have to go all over the world trying to get other people's. Um, things are changing, though. I will say this, because of climate change, as the temperatures move north, getting hotter and hotter, French champagne producers are moving to southern England and growing champagne there, except they can't grow it, champagne. They call it English fizz. So let me close off by keep calm, drink wine. I hope that made uh, was enjoyable, was interesting. And if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Patrick, that was fantastic. And I have to admit, I was swirling, swishing, slurping, and I almost spilled on my white shirt. <laughs> well, cheers. <laughs> well, thank you so much. We do have some questions here. Um, and forgive me if I pronounce your names wrong. Merson Ferguson says, I'm always concerned about which wines are best. Is there a rule of thumb to be using when choosing? Yes. Uh, taste them all and see which one you like. There you go. <laughs> there, is, there is no best. It's... it's, it's um, Matter of taste. All, all personal taste. Wonderful. All right. And Antonio says, my father's family are port wine producers. My 92, 99 years old uncle always says, white wine is not wine. And they're Portuguese. So how do you see this? Um, well, I sympathize with that. I love um, uh, port for, from from which obviously comes from Portugal. Um, I can't think of any white wines from Portugal that, oh, of course, no, there, there is an exception. It's called Vino Verde from the north of Portugal. And that's delicious. Very low in alcohol, but very refreshing. Great, um, a, a great lunchtime South Florida drink. Uh, one thing we do in England, uh, it's a very nice tradition, is that when a baby is born, we give the baby a bottle of port, oh. Portuguese port, not to drink then, for the baby to open on his 21st birthday or when he graduates from college or when he gets married. Um, that's a very nice English tradition because port, you know, lasts for, I mean, you can, you can get hundred year old ports. Uh, okay. it, lasts, it lasts a long time. So Antonio, you have to buy your uncle that bottle of wine. Can you say what it is again, Patrick? Oh, Vino Verde. Vino I'm Verde. Sure you know. Okay. Sure you know all about it. Okay. All right. Peter Vanek says, you mentioned a lot of wine growing regions, but did not mention Niagara. Why is that? Uh, well, I mentioned uh, Finger Lakes in New York, which is near Niagara. Uh, it isn't. Um, neither Finger Lakes nor Niagara is a major wine producing area uh, in the world. And I couldn't go into every single area this no, evening. Of course not. 
All right, so Anna Alvarez says, what is the most important human skill a winemaker should have? Oh gosh, I didn't know we were gonna get philosophic here. <laughs> um, probably the nose. And um, if I can come up close to the uh, camera, you will see that a large nose is a very important uh, attribute. So maybe it's not a human skill, it's a human trait. <laughs> yes, and I, I'm, I'm not a winemaker, I'm a wine drinker, so. Well. <laughs> okay, uh, Ludmilla Taran says, Patrick, are you familiar with the wines from south of Russia in the Black Sea? They are, the, 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 yes, I am. Well, in fact, the wines of Georgia, that's where, it's near Mount Ararat, that's where wine started. The, uh, I know the Bible says that Noah, the first thing he did was plant a vineyard, but we've actually discovered that that's where the original vines were grown, around Mount Ararat. And um, the wines of Georgia, uh, they're made the same, they've been making them the same way for 4,000 years now. Um, the trouble was that with the communist government, they imposed, um, um, they, the, the, to make good wine, you need to put your name on it. And with the collectivization under the Soviet system, uh, that all went away. So all they were doing was producing really crappy wine, uh, high alcohol. Um, but now that the Soviet system has gone and the vineyards are going back where people are taking a pride, no, no, the, the, the wines from Southern Russia should be super. Okay, wonderful. And you kind of touch on this at the end about temperatures rising in France, but Diana Landero wants to know, how is climate change affecting wine production around the world? Um, well, it's changing things. For example, I've been emphasizing, particularly in Europe, and I've been saying, well, you know, we've been doing this for 3,000 years, and this is, and we've now, pr for example, um, the Duke of Burgundy, where he was quite right to say that the Pinot Noir and the Chardonnay are perfect for his, his area. But because of rising climate change, the growers in Burgundy are becoming worried that the temperatures are rising and for the good Pinot Noir and the good Chardonnays, they need a certain temperature. And they are worrying that maybe, I don't know how many years can we talk about, but 30, 40 years, maybe they won't be able to make those wines. That's why, and Champagne, which is on almost the same latitude, that's why the Champagne growers are moving into England. Um, they're following the, in other words, they're following the temperature. Following the temperature. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Great. Well, Patrick, that's all the questions that we had, and I look forward to sharing a Chateau Lafitte with you someday soon. Thank you so much. This was fantastic. Thank you all for participating. And um, let's all send Patrick our thanks for a, an amazing, interesting presentation. Cheers, everybody. Cheers. Happy, happy Rotary. Happy Rotary. <laughs> all right. Now, if you haven't already registered for your sessions tomorrow, you can do so by going to rotary6990.org forward slash DTA. And there's 15 sessions for you to choose from. We're going to kick it off at 8 a.m. with a presentation from Rotary International President-elect Holger Nash. That is quite an honor for us to have him. And uh, thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed day two of District Training Assembly. Bye-bye. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>